Our last speaker for this afternoon before a discussion, Dr. McGilvery, our Chief of uh, Cardiothoracic Surgery, transplant as well, uh, adult congenital heart disease. He's a Houstonian now. He, he's been in Houston for almost two years <laughs> uh, from Boston. Great to have you. Thanks. Hi, everybody. I'm sorry I'm late. I was giving a talk in another, uh, in another room. And so I'm going to, I know this session has been on uh, valvular heart disease. And uh, you've uh, probably learned uh, much more in the last uh, couple of hours about valvular heart disease. And uh, so I won't even try to add to that. I will talk a little bit about surgery for valvular heart disease. Um, as many of you know, the, all of the valves in the heart uh, for a variety of different pathologies have been successfully treated with uh, valve replacement. Uh, all, all four of the uh, main cardiac uh, valves very successfully uh, taking care of patients with uh, uh, otherwise lethal valvular heart disease. Whether it's tissue valves or mechanical valves, uh, they've all, they work uh, very well at treating the underlying problem, uh, but they all have their own sets of issues. Uh, as I tell patients for when we do valve replacements, you trade one set of issues with the natural, hi with the natural history of their underlying disease for another set of problems with a valve replacement that they get. Tissue valves, they have limited durability. Certainly the, the younger patients are, um, the more limited that durability. Uh, patients can get structural uh, valve degeneration. Uh, patients can uh, get endocarditis in tissue valves. Uh, patients uh, can get uh, uh, acute or chronic degeneration requiring sudden or more chronic need to re-replace or re-intervene re on these valves. Mechanical valves, they require taking uh, anticoagulants. If you don't take an anticoagulant, they thrombose. If you do take anticoagulants, even if you're in therapeutic range, uh, the risk of uh, bleeding complications is not uh, insignificant. Uh, yes, I'd say warfarin has its own set of uh, of problems, and until we develop a better anticoagulant for patients with mechanical valves, uh, it's, uh, I'd say more and more patients are opting uh, less and less to have mechanical valves. Uh, graphically stated, again, you trade one set of problems for another, whether you have a tissue valve or a mechanical valve that is surgically implanted. And I would say even we'll find, I suspect, with transcatheter valves, a similar set of issues. Uh, whether it be structural degeneration or the risk of uh, bleeding or thrombosis. I want to spend a little bit more uh, what's left of my time talking about the benefits of valve repair. Uh, certainly not as uh, good of an option in patients with stenotic lesions, but uh, with regurgitant lesions of the valves, uh, what we've come to find out is that not only is uh, surgical reconstruction of those valves a viable option, option, but it's uh, uh, certainly a much, we think, a much better option. Uh, Carpentier, who is a French cardiac surgeon, uh, and his wife came up with the uh, classification for the mechanisms of mitral regurgitation, uh, type 1 being uh, normal valve motion, more commonly due to annular dilation or uh, perforations of the valve. Type 2 would be excessive uh, leaflet uh, motion. Uh, commonly with either myxomatous uh, degeneration of the valve or ruptured chordae from the valve. And then type 3, which has two uh, type 3A restricted uh, lesions, commonly from uh, rheumatic heart disease, or type 3B, uh, those from uh, apical tethering with, from ventricular dilation uh, issues. I guess a more simplistic way to think about it are problems with annular dilation, problems with the leaflets, or problems with the uh, ventricle. Uh, those patients who have uh, a dilated annulus uh, that uh, interfere with the co-optation of the uh, mitral valve leaflets, a really effective way to manage that surgically is to do a ring annuloplasty. Uh, it uh, re-creates uh, the uh, normal geometry uh, and function of the uh, mitral valve. Uh, patients who have uh, destructive lesions from endocarditis a number of different options you can do surgically. We used to wait for the uh, infection to be all gone and uh, uh, cleared for six weeks. 
Uh, more and more, we're learning that uh, early intervention on these valves not only uh, is a better way to help clear the infection on the valve, uh, but to allow you to spare the valve, uh, either by uh, cutting out the vegetation on the mitral valve and patch closing it, uh, or resecting that portion of the valve with the vegetation and uh, uh, closing it with either a quadrangular or triangular uh, resection. Big debate, I don't know if Dr. Laurie has spoken with you uh, today, but uh, sort of the resect versus respect uh, the mitral valve. Uh, certainly Carpentier uh, and many of his disciples or acolytes uh, have effectively uh, managed uh, myxomatous degeneration of the valve with resectional techniques, cutting whatever portion of the valve is abnormal, uh, cutting that portion out and reconstructing it um, uh, with uh, annuloplasty techniques. Cordal replacement techniques are to leave the leaflets alone and to reconstruct the cordae, not only if, they're, uh, if they've been ruptured, but even if they're just elongated, uh, to recreate the symmetry of the valve with, uh, with uh, and the, these cordae are uh, most commonly made from uh, PTFE that have a very similar uh, tensile strength. They're a little bit elastic, but very strong, just like the normal cordae. Uh, there have been a number of studies over the years that demonstrate that mitral valve repair is indeed better than mitral valve replacement. You have better left ventricular function in the short and the long term. There's improved short term and improved long term survival. Uh, and then, like some of the earlier slides I showed you, that you can. Um, in most of these patients, free them up from anticoagulation. It decreases the risk of endocarditis, decreases the risk of thromboembolism and anticoagulated uh, related hemorrhage. And from uh, several of the studies that were cited, again, better short and long-term survival with uh, mitral valve repair va versus replacement. Uh, and that the durability, I mean, one of the things that people talked about when I was in training was, oh, well, okay, sure, you can repair them but eventually they're gonna to need to be replaced over time. You may as well just get it done. And what we've learned is that the long-term durability of a, uh, of a good mitral valve repair uh, is quite good in that uh, over 20 years, uh, in, uh, certainly in Carpentier series, that the freedom from reoperation is about 90%. Uh, but that's if it's a good repair. Uh, what you don't want to do as a surgeon is leave a valve that is repaired and not functioning very well, leaving somebody with residual mitral regurgitation. Uh, uh, there used to be a thought that, oh, well, geez, it's moderate, that's better than uh, severe, and they're better off with that moderate uh, regurgitation than getting a mitral valve replacement. That, as it turns out, is not true. A second uh, uh, adjunct to that is what we've learned is that in patients with ischemic mitral regurgitation, so that's a normal mitral valve uh, that is regurgitant, normal structural mitral valve that's regurgitant because of that Carpentier 3B uh, pathology, uh, that that may be an exception. Another exception to a mitral valve repair is better to a replacement. There was a recent CTS net multicenter. Uh, uh, randomized trial that demonstrated that the, uh, the survival with repair and replacement were the same and that the recurrent mitral regurgitation with repair was unacceptably high. Uh, and so uh, many of us uh, in that situation going in to do a coronary revascularization surgically would opt to replace that valve rather than repair it and not violating those other uh, principles. In keeping with what we've learned about the mitral valve for regurgitant lesions, we're now starting to adopt for the aortic valve, again, for regurgitant lesions. Uh, you've probably already heard uh, today about the uh, transformation into transcatheter aortic valves for uh, aortic valve uh, stenosis, uh, which, which I think has um, really transformed how we take, will take care of those patients. I'd say the same thing's true with aortic regurgitation, that we're moving away from uh, aortic valve replacement for those patients uh, into aortic valve repair. Um, uh, so there was uh, early on, uh, 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 
I would say uh, experience with aortic valve repair was not that good, that the uh, durability was not that great, uh, and that the freedom from your operation uh, was uh, unacceptably uh, uh, low. Uh, and that, I think, was mostly because the focus was on just repairing the aortic valve cusps, looking at the problem with the cusps, going in and repairing a cusp, thinking that would take care of the problem. Uh, uh, you know, it, when it's always interesting when you look at the echo of the aortic valve, you look at the Mercedes-Benz sign and you want it to be uh, perfectly symmetric. But like the Mercedes-Benz sign, which is a two-dimensional structure, what we've come to learn is the aortic valve and the aortic root is a three-dimensional structure. And how well that valve functions is very dependent on establishing or reestablishing the three-dimensional function of the valve. Uh, it shouldn't really be the Mercedes-Benz sign that you're looking for. It should be the Burger King crown, uh, that uh, the, the, the base, the base of the ring, or the, the ventricular aortic junction, uh, should be about the same size as the sinotubular junction, and the scalloped uh, insertion of the cusps into that aortic root are very much dependent upon uh, the functional anatomy and geometry uh, of the valve. It's pretty interesting, in the, in the mid-70s, there was a surgeon and a, a biomedical engineer that took a bunch of uh, human cadaveric aortic roots and, and essentially looked at uh, pressure and geometric analyses of these roots and, and very accurately demonstrated the um, uh, the importance of co-optation of the valve cusps and the different forces that are uh, that go on uh, inside the aortic root. And, and using that as a template is really how we should think about aortic regurgitation, looking at what those forces are. El Kohori and his uh, team over in Belgium have again, in re recreating the Carpentier classification, have also done that for aortic regurgitation. What is the mechanism of the aortic regurgitation? Is it just a cusp problem? Is it a sinotubular junction problem? Is it a basal or ring problem? Or is it a combination of some or many of those? Understanding why the valve is regurgitant is a much better way going in preoperatively uh, for a successful operation to fix it. And again, focusing on not just the cusps, but the sinotubular junction and the ventricular aortic junction uh, to reconstruct the FAA, the functional aortic annulus. There's an intraoperative picture of a tri aortic valve uh, with uh, one, of the, one of the valve cusps is a little bit, uh, um, prolapses a little bit because of it's redundant. If you just plicate that uh, leaflet, uh, and get uh, all of the leaflets to have the uh, uh, a same uh, length of the free edge uh, so that they, uh, the effective height is the same. Uh, a more extensive repair of that cusp. Uh, uh, but uh, what we've, as I said, what we've learned is that the free edge of the cusp is very dependent in terms of its function on the diameter of the basal ring and the diameter of the, uh, of the uh, sinotubular junction. And so uh, those patients that earlier on in the Mayo Clinic series that had a, a, a problem with, uh, of needing to be, uh, of getting recurrent aortic regurgitation, we're finding is you, if there is dilation of the, uh, of the basal ring, then in addition to doing a cusp repair, it's important to go in and stabilize that basal ring or the ventricular aortic junction, either with a ring like we do with the mitral valve or by doing a uh, valve sparing aortic root replacement and stabilizing that, uh, the base of the valve with a graft. And this is, again, mobilizing, excuse me, mobilizing down the aortic root to the left ventricular outflow tract from outside of the uh, aortic root, resecting the uh, sinuses, even if the sinuses are not diseased so you can get at the uh, uh, basal ring. 
in placing plication stitches uh, in the aortic uh, annulus, uh, and then using a uh, graft to stabilize uh, the basal ring, and then uh, sewing uh, the, uh, the valve cusps that are attached to a rim of uh, the uh, aortic root back into the graft, uh, paying careful attention to reconstruct the symmetric geometry, and then the coronary arteries are reimplanted. And also, uh, just like that paper from the mid-70s, actually measuring the geometric height and the effectric height and uh, making sure that you have uh, an appropriate repair that can be, while you're in the operating room, interrogated while the heart is beating uh, with the transesophageal echo to make sure that you have indeed uh, accomplished what you set out to do. And at least in the short uh, and intermediate term, the freedom from reoperation is actually pretty good in carefully selected patients. This is certainly a much more complicated operation than uh, an aortic valve replacement with a mechanical or a tissue prosthesis. But what we hope is that over time, it'll be a more effective operation, not only in freedom from reoperation, but decreasing the um, incidence of endocarditis and thromboembolic complications. So even though the way we're doing things seems to work out pretty well, uh, I would say there's always a better way that we can uh, do it, if not, a, if not more effective, perhaps safer or faster or with less cost. And I think all of those issues are things that we need to pay more attention to. With that, thanks very much for your attention.